Good morning. Sorry for the long, awkward stare while I thumb through this stuff here. Title for the sermon this morning, and well, the passage for the sermon this morning is 1 Corinthians 15, 29 through 34. The title for the sermon is Bad Company Corrupts Good Morals. The deception and consequence of compromise in what some consider small and inconsequential matters of the faith. Engaging the implications of allowing others to draw us away from the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? The dead are not raised at all. Why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers. By my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the morning you've given us together in Christ. I thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the salvation that he has earned for us. Thank you for the magnificence of God. that we can sit here with one another, stand here with one another, and say, Behold our God. I thank you for that, Father. I thank you for the voices in unison praising your, your holy name. I pray this morning that we would see the significance of a passage otherwise glossed over like so many others. Help us to see the beauty of the gospel in Christ and take the admonition from your word. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. If you can't tell, I like informality. Down from, you know, wearing tennis shoes to jeans and, you know, just kind of my general demeanor. Um, Ryan, is this good? Yeah? Okay. Just down to my general demeanor. I don't mind the interruptions. I don't mind Miss Helen bring me up a bottle of water. I actually am very thankful for Miss Helen bringing me some water this morning. Sometimes we get so caught up into the pageantry of what goes on just in the, the baseline liturgy that we do possess, whether we want to admit it or not, that we fail to see that we're just people in a room doing what we believe is good and right. We've gathered, to get, we've gathered together in the name of Jesus Christ, lifting our voices as one, praising his name. We then come before him, opening his word, and seek to worship him in spirit and truth. That's the simplicity of what we're doing here today. And there needs to be nothing other than that. We, we need to be uh, comfortable with this. Informality very often comes from a comfort, a, a familiarity. And, and I hope that that's exactly what we are here, comfortable to rejoice, kind of like a family. You know, there, there's a manner of gathering that a family has which... One of the first things that I think of is comfort. You're just okay with you. I love gathering together with family because I forget all the other nonsense that that surrounds. I don't have to think about making anybody happy or, you know, watch my P's and Q's or this and that. I'm just me and and I enjoy that and and that's what we should be here. Now, I'm not saying that we need to sin that grace may abound and we need to come and bleed all over one another, but I am saying that as we've gathered together in the name of Christ, just be okay with who you are and where you're at and be okay with us and where we are and where we're at. And that's kind of a cool thing. That's an environment that I think uh, has been cultivated here and is continuing to be so. So this morning as I jump into my sermon, I'm going to have a pre-sermon sermon, sermon. all right? So that was at the table with Dad. This is, uh, you know, the pre-sermon sermon, sermon, and I'm going to kind of give you a a run-up to the sermon with the pre-sermon sermon. sermon. And the run-up is from what is called an ad hominem. If you don't remember that, it doesn't matter. It's called an ad hominem argument. 
And that's where we're at within Paul's writing here. And ad hominem simply means an appeal to emotion. All right, so Paul here is appealing to emotion. So for of you who like language and little things like that, you know, take that home with you. For those of you who don't, forget it. And just realize that the Apostle Paul in the passage right now is coming to argue to their feelers. All right, so we've been weeks and weeks in this idea that the church in Corinth doesn't believe in the resurrection from the dead, and, and yet they still hold to the gospel. And so he's going through saying, hey, this is a necessary and good thing. And he gives the intellectual reasons, the theological reasons. And now he's simply giving the, I'm going to come in and poke you in the eye with a sharp stick. I'm going to show you the inconsistency in your belief. And I'm going to call you out on it. And hopefully it elicits an, elicits an emotional response to lead you to repent of your aberrant or errant doctrine. Your, your wrong way of thinking. And as I do it, I'm going to appeal to something that I've appealed to for the past couple of weeks. And, and what I've appealed to is not directly from this passage, but it's just the basic idea. It, if this isn't real and this isn't true, what's the point? And, and I'm not kidding. You know, my wife gets really uncomfortable when I say the statements of, well, if this isn't true, I'm going to go get a 12-pack of beer and some guns and we're going to go have some fun. All right, because tomorrow I die. And I, I make that statement not because I'm chewing at the bit to go do that and just like, man, there's no Jesus, just watch what I do. You know, I have to develop an accent when I say that. Um, I, I'm not really wanting to do that. But, but that really is what it comes down to. If, if there is no resurrection of the dead, if the message of the gospel, the good news is not true, then what is the point? Frederick Nietzsche had it right. Nihilists who believe that there is nothing and, and nothing matters for no reason at all, they had it right. Life is a pointless endeavor in futility if there is not the hope of redemption in Christ Jesus. And so Paul's going to argue from a standpoint of emotion, an ad hominem argument. And as he does so, he comes to this point that becomes a distraction. You see, when you read the Bible, I'm helping you read the Bible right now, okay? When you read the Bible, you come across things like this, and your mind may explode. What do you mean, the baptism of the dead? And you totally forget that for how many verses now, 28 of them in particular, we, we've been rehearsing the idea that the resurrection is a real thing and the gospel is predicated upon the resurrection from the dead. But then you read this, you know, this thing here and being baptized on behalf of those who are dead. And you're like, I don't know, that sounds like some sort of mystical sacramentalism that I'm not really into. Um, it sounds kind of goofy. And it's, you know, distracting. You, you see, we get into it and we miss the point and we read right over it and we move on to something else. And then we come to the passage, good, you know, or bad company corrupts good morals or ruins good morals. And we see it as kind of detached because it seemingly is so and we're lost again. Let me assure you it all connects. It all connects. It all flows through. It has a flow of thought. I'm going to help us with that here today. And as we go through, I'm going to try to eliminate some of the problems. Now, here's the thing. Baptism of the dead. Verse 29. When we read across that, what is the most natural reading of that? What is the easiest reading of that? Well, I'm going to out and say it. It's, the easiest reading of that is that there were people that were baptizing for the dead on the behalf of others. That's what it's naturally, that's the most easy grammatical way to read it. Well, does anybody have a problem with that? I do. I mean, raise your hand, don't raise your hand. I don't care, but I have a problem with that because of the rest of Scripture. If you've read your Bible at all, or even just the first 15 chapters of 1 Corinthians, you might be like, hmm, sing, these things don't seem to match up. What are you doing, Paul? Well, let's read it real quick once again. Verse 29, otherwise... What do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? So Paul's asking a question. Point one, is he saying this is a good thing? 
Is he saying that this is something y'all need to do? Is he saying that this is, you know, coherent and fits together with everything else that he has written or the New Testament authors have written? The answer is no. Just because he mentions it doesn't mean that he's condoning it. And a lot of people will argue from the negative. Well, he didn't correct it. So? That's how I argue that. So? What, what does that mean? He didn't correct it. You got to realize that what we have here is not the totality of Paul's thought or his belief in certain situations. And just because he didn't address the issue doesn't mean that at some point he hadn't. Doesn't mean that he then therefore condones it. In, in all honesty, there's a whole lot of I don't know going on here. And here's why. No other place in the scripture does it talk about this. Cross-reference all you want. This is a singularity. This is one place that this one thing happens. Okay? Secondly, there's nothing in history that speaks of this. It is not only until recent history within the Mormon faith that this actually started happening. And that was predicated upon this passage here. And so in reality, you have a lot of silence some people will then come to this passage and go, see, we, we, we can't understand the Bible, to which my typical response is, Pfft. I argue it like that as well. Says you. Just because we don't understand every little thing that is in there in its totality doesn't mean that we can't understand the Bible. And in all actuality, let us look at this from a grammatical standpoint. From a grammatical standpoint, this is not the main subject. This is not Paul's point. Paul is driving home a particular point about the resurrection and the significance within the Christian faith. We know how this functions within the text. The way that it functions within the text is essentially to say that you guys believe this, this idea of baptism for the dead, but you also believe that there's no resurrection from the dead. And they don't meet up. What he's basically saying is there is an incongruent thing within your belief structure. Now, let's take this to my children. All right? When you correct your child, do you correct everything that there is to correct? No. Okay, if you do, please stop. Not a good habit. You can't correct everything. Why? Because that child goes into overload in that moment. You know, you don't go... You really should hold that spoon differently. And that brings me to my next thing, the way that you keep your room. Then that brings me to my next thing, the way that you talk to your mom. And that brings me to one more thing. I'm almost done, maybe. And you just kind of start ragging on the kid. Well, the same thing happens. Have you been reading 1 Corinthians with me? Paul is swinging a heavy bat here. He's had a lot of points for them to think over, and there are probably many, many more points of correction that are potential within that group of people. Do you think he's going to correct everything that's there? No. So he's just mentioning something that's going on. Again, we don't have any historical evidence of this stuff having gone on. We don't have any other biblical evidence. We have no reason to think that this is something that I should then grab onto and use as the basis for major structures of practice and faith. We should simply come along and let it function within the text and leave a big old fat question mark by it. And then not miss what the text is saying. And see, a lot of people, when they read, they read across it, they have an issue with it, they want to search it out, and then they move past it after searching it out. You have the naysayers and the doubters and the, the, the troublemakers that go along with it, and they fail to see what's there. My friends, I, I don't think we know what is there about baptism of the dead. I read 40, and I'm not exaggerating, I read 40 different opinions about what it is saying. And in those 40, there are 38 that are wrong. <laughs> that are objectively, objectively wrong. Why? Because they don't match up with the rest of Scripture. There are two that are plausible and right. Maybe three. Reading this most natural reading and say that Paul's not condoning it. Just say that this was a practice that he had not yet corrected. That's one. So sorry, it's 37 that are wrong. The second one is to see this as some sort of metaphorical reference to 
being baptized as one who was dead, and then Christ experienced new life. Go read Romans chapter 6, 1 through 5, with the baptism being that hopeful expectation for resurrection in the time to come. And the third one, I wrote the third one down because I forgot it. I keep forgetting it. Basically, it's a position that is stating that Paul is naysaying what's going on there. That's the third position. Where Paul, in saying that, is kind of saying it sarcastically, tongue-in-cheek. Which one do I fall in? I fall in the I don't know. You've got three plausible options that go, well, that's not too awful. I fall into the I don't know. And then I ask myself the question, do I need to know? If there's nothing else in the whole rest of Scripture that says anything about that, do I need to know? No. Do I need to know how it functions, though? Yes. Do I know how it functions? Absolutely. It's very, very clear. Read it with me. Starting back in verse 28. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Let's stop right there. If we remember the resurrection from the dead and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead was a demonstration of his supremacy over all things and his submission to the Father. And as he does that, he is going to come back and in putting all things in subjection underneath himself at a point, he is going to put himself in subjection under who? The Father. That the Father might be what? All in all. That he might be the most supreme. That he might be the eminent, preeminent, supreme one. And the resurrection of the dead works towards that end, that God might be all in all. He then hits an otherwise. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? You see, they had it basically within their structure of thinking by this weird practice that we know nothing of, that there is a hope in future glory of some sort. And what he's basically going to come down and say is, if you believe in this baptism of the dead business, predicated it off the idea of resurrection, but you don't believe in resurrection, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you thinking and acting like this? That doesn't match. Continuing on. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? What's the point? Why are you guys practicing this? He then continues on. Why are we in danger every hour? You see, here's the thing. These people believe this set of things about Jesus Christ and it put them in danger. It's not a danger we have necessarily face at this moment, but that danger was at the cost of maybe their lives. If you read Hebrews 11, it was at the, or Hebrews 10, it was at the expense of their housing and even being thrown in jail. They were ostracized from the community and portions of the community because of their belief. Do you realize they were called cannibals? They were accused of sexual misconduct and being molesters and, and incestuous. This is how the community thought of them. And he goes, and we're at danger every hour for this stuff. What's the point? If it's not real, why? Why? Would we do this? Continues on, verse 31. I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. His protest is against their lack of belief in the resurrection and their inconsistency of belief. He says, I protest because I, well, I love you all. I have pride in you all. I, I think highly of you all. I have a care and concern for you all. And I die for you. I, I make a great effort to give my life for your sake. I spend myself for you, is what he's saying. 
And, and there's a motivation for that. The motivation is Christ Jesus crucified. The motivation is Jesus Christ resurrected. The motivation is the hope and future glory. The motivation is so that you might have something good, so that you might actually have something substantial rather than just vague well-wishing or religious pretense that makes you feel better in a moment, and then when you leave out, you have nothing to go with it. Paul says, I, I die for you every day. I, I want good for you. And this is so real that it is worthy of death. Here's the question that I have for us. Is our belief in that place where Paul's is expressing here? Have we allowed ourselves to be influenced or convinced or deceived regarding certain matters of truth? You see, the thing is, is as I'm sitting here thinking today, most people in this room here have no, and I say most because I don't know everybody's heart and I don't know everybody's belief, but most people in this room here, I have the distinct understanding that they believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you didn't, you wouldn't be showing up and hanging out with me most likely. You'd be like, that dude's crazy. He's always talking about Jesus raising from the dead. And you'd go do something else. And and I don't want to talk about this someone else or somewhere else because that's outside of here. And I have really, honestly, no benefit in talking about them and what they're doing. What I do have a benefit in do is dealing with our own hearts collectively within this room. And what in here do we have to do with that is incongruent within our belief? That is kind of like this resurrection from the dead while at the same time practicing something else that goes against it. That's a hard question to ask, man. That just is. Because in any point within this room, there's probably a a plurality of people that have the same issue, but there's most likely a peppering and a sprinkling of different sets of beliefs and thinking that are, well, conflicting. Absolutely conflicting. You see, the thing is, is we have to engage within our own hearts and ask ourselves that question. When we come along this passage, rather than making it a big deal and saying, see, this is why I don't believe this thing, or getting overwhelmed by it and rolling through it, it is simply to be an exercise And how am I like the church in Corinth? And I can't tell you that. I wish I could. I wish I could grab your little heart. Maybe it's a big heart. Grab your big heart. I don't mean little hearts. You guys got big hearts. Grab your big heart and, and examine for you and go, you know what you need to do? And then you'd be like, oh, gee, thanks, buddy. And then you like go about your way. But you know what? I can't. Nor do you necessarily want me to. Nor after three or four of your big hearts do I really want to anymore. The fact is, is my relationship between God is mine and your relationship between God is yours. And then when we gather together, our relationship with God affects one another. And so it's incumbent upon me to examine my heart, do the hard work of heart work, examine my belief, and do that hard work for the benefit and upbuilding of others. See, here, here's the thing. When he goes down and he talks about bad company ruining good morals, we, we take that passage out of context and we look at it and we kind of go, well, that's a weird place for that. But what he's referring to is the church in Corinth, and you'll kind of see this as you get down into 2 Corinthians, the church in Corinth is being influenced by people who are coming in and saying, nah, this ain't true. And we have that in our society This is not just a passage that you use for your kids going, don't hang out with them. How I've used it, I've not used it. Heard it used repeatedly. Parents using it towards their children when in reality, parents should be wary of the things that they keep company with. The television they watch, the books they read, even the Christian books they read. That's the keeping of bad company. I tell you what, I want to say one of the major problems that threatens us, that I don't know for sure is true in your life or not, but one of the major problems that threatens us as a congregation is the temptation that is presented within the world to not think that the Bible is what it is. 
To think of the Bible as insignificant. To think the Bible as unimportant. To think of the Bible as something that is meant for the scholars and is meant for somebody who has the time and it is meant for somebody who has an understanding or an education or whatever it might be. That it is not meant for you per se. Or you may think that it's for you, but you don't necessarily think that all that is in there needs to be heated at the level it needs to be heated. And when you read the Bible, you read some radical things that according to the flesh and the world are radical. But here's the thing. If you, in a moment, and here's the Pauline moment, here's the same logic that he used here. If you for a moment, and in many moments, and and hold true to be mostly that the Bible is kind of true, then your belief in the resurrection and your belief in faith in Jesus Christ is kind of pointless. The Bible can't just be kind of true. Because how do you determine what is true about it and what is not? Is it based off of your like or your dislike? Is it based off of your preference or your upbringing? What is it based off of? Is it based off of your level of understanding or your level of acceptance based on your understanding? Man, I know that's a lot of effort to think through and work through. But I do think that's the thing that is tempting us. I see it within Southern Baptist ranks. I see it within Reformed Baptist ranks. I see it within all the people around me. I see it in this whole Beth Moore controversy. Here is a woman that has taught many of you women. Has she not? I will say yes for you because yes, I know she has. And taught you very many good things. Yes, absolutely, 100%. But here is the slippery slope that she has traversed off of in which she is beginning to say that the Bible is not all that is cracked up to be. And we have advanced within our society. Here's the lie of our culture. We have advanced within our society and culture to a standpoint where we have grown past our need for some of these antiquated things. It's the old argument of modernity. It's not a new argument. It's been argued for hundreds of years. That our technology, that our a massing of information that our growth and understanding as a human race and in in our just historical place and position of, of privilege alleviates us from having to take the bible to be what it is to which my response is says them don't fall into that trap that's a lie it's a deception It is a deception for them to come along and say, you know what's here? It's really not that important. What's important is the idea of Jesus. What's important is the love of Jesus. What's important is these things when I would say, yes, the idea of Jesus is important. Yes, the love of Jesus is important. And all that he said. And all that he said. We do not have the privilege or the prerogative to pick and choose as we please those things which we like. Because if we gather into any group and we pick and choose what we like, what will be left at the end of the business meeting? Nothing. Nothing. And not just because you have me in there pulling the thread of the sweater and emptying it all out. But because we can't agree on anything. I know that you like people here, and I know that you like you and the people that you're sitting around, and I hope you like me, and I hope I like you, but the thing is, at the end of the day, we can't agree on how to cook eggs. We, we couldn't agree on what pizza is the best pizza. And some of you are like, well, I don't even like pizza. Exactly! That's my point! You see, the thing is, is God's Word is God's word and the bad company that we might keep is going to tell us otherwise. It is going to tempt us in the direction that we are going to begin to not think certain things are as important as they are. And I almost was on the edge of a particular movement to which I didn't want to think of sin as big of a deal as sin is. And, and it's the, the libertines, as they've called them in history's past. And when I was in college, I, I, you, know, you know what? Drinking's not a big deal. And you know what? I, I can go out to the, to the party and have a good time and hang out and so on and so forth. And then my buddy Aaron Frude one time goes, well, sure, you can go to the party. But, you know, my excuse was when Jesus went to the party. And he goes, well, when Jesus went to the party, guess what? 
Everybody stopped and listened to him. Mr. Johnson, how many parties have you stopped and everybody looks at you for something other than you being an idiot? I had to, none. Not one have I stopped to go, you know, do y'all know Jesus? Not one. Not one did I go out and exalt Christ in what I was doing. You see, it's not just the, the college party scene. It's, it's later portions in life as well to begin to think that things are not as big a deal as they are. There is that movement from that college scene to that place later in life in which we don't want to make as big a deal of sin as we should because we don't want to look like the fundies. And you know what I mean when I say fundy, all right? If I have to explain it to you, we could be here for a while. You know, the self-righteous, super rigid, dress a certain way, sing a certain way, act a certain way kind of folks. And if you don't act like them, walk like them, talk like them, all that stuff like them, guess what? You're not one of them. And I, you know, I want to push back against that. I don't want to be like them, right? And so in, in pushing back against them, where do you end up? Up to here in sin. Suffering because of your own stupidity and foolishness. And wanton behavior against Christ. See, the thing is, is we can't live in a reactionary way allowing that bad company to corrupt us. We can't allow somebody else's error to help form our theological underpinnings. I think that's another place that we are tempted to be. I'm going to look at somebody else's error and I ain't going to be like them. So we totally jump off the other side of the road in the other ditch committing a totally separate error, not being like them, just like we have vowed, but totally going against the gospel. This is why he says that. Bad company corrupts good morals. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought wild beasts at Ephesus, if the dead are not raised? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. In other words, if we allow this bad company to corrupt our good morals and, and come in and infiltrate us in this way, then what is the point of suffering as I do? What is the point of fighting and laboring? And let me just be as rude as possible. What's the point in loving you people? Hopefully that will calf you up. What is the point in loving you? You see, because the thing is, is I don't always love you, believe it or not. I didn't love you at about 4 a.m. this morning. I woke up. I don't want to. I don't want to. Bessie's like, you don't want to what? I just don't want to. Why? Because I'm sinful. Because I was tired. Because I went to bed too late. Because fill in the blank. You can imagine, right? And here's the thing is I had to get on my face before God, repent of that wickedness, and seek to love you. And so my question is, is why would I do that early in the morning? Why would I labor in my heart to make sure that when I came, I was prepared to love you? Why would I do that? Well, I'll tell you why I would do that. Jesus. Because of Jesus and what he's given me. Because of Jesus, and not just in the gifting that he's giving me, but the salvation and life that he's given me. He's forgiven me. He's given me the unimaginable grace and mercy. He hasn't given me what I deserve. He's given me what I do not deserve in and through himself. He died on the cross for my sins and says, I want you to be mine. And the offer of free life, as I took it upon myself, is becoming that gift, not just that it is the heavenly you know, bus pass, fire insurance, whatever you want to call it, but it is something that has transformed me in the way that I act and behave in accordance with you. And that doesn't mean that I'm perfect, and it doesn't mean that I don't struggle with sin, but what it means is as I struggle with sin, I struggle and suffer for your sake and Christ's sake. Some of you guys might be, ah, oh, it's good for you. That's what the preacher does. No, 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 no. That's what Christians do. Why? Okay, let me, let me flip it on you. Why would you come to church? I can say this to myself because I was the one singing. The singing wasn't that good. And the sermon wasn't that good. Man, he droned on. And those chairs were comfortable until about minute 37. And then it was uncomfortable. 
Not only did I have to go to the bathroom, and I didn't want to go to the bathroom because he might look at me as I get up to go to the bathroom. If you've got to go to the bathroom, get up, go to the bathroom. It's right over there. You can come back, I promise. It's Ms. Sheldon. And, and you, you have to be nice to that person that may not be nice to you. And you may not want to see this person that you saw before because you know what they've done. And, and why do you come to church? Why would you seek to love a group of people like sitting, you're sitting with? You could be doing anything else. You could be doing anything else. Football's on, almost. There's animals to kill in the wood. Up on a hill somewhere out in a the field. There's fish to be biting. There's quilts to be quilted. There's dinners to be fixed and eaten. There's rest to be had. And yet, and yet, you come here, you worship the Lord. Why? Because it's real. Because it's important to you. Because God is good. Because the cross is not this joke and the tomb that is empty is not a joke. It's not just a pretense. It is what is true. It is what is right. It is what is good. And Paul says, I fight all of these things and if this isn't real, hey man, let's have a good time and burn it down. Some of you wish I'd quit saying that most likely, but that's where I'm going to go. I promise you, we're starting fires and there's going to be about 10 of you with me, maybe. You see, the thing is, is if this isn't real, what is the point is what he is saying? Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. And here is the indictment that is laid down upon us. Some have no knowledge of God. Wake up, pay attention to the things that have been brought. Stop engaging in the religious pretense of organized religion and actually begin to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Wake up. Don't fall prey to the, the victimization that comes through the bad company that's simply trying to sell something, simply trying to get their name out there and, and make a mark for themselves within the book industry or, or within the preaching industry. Yes, there's a preaching industry. If you haven't seen it, let me come and show it to you. It's there. They want to make their mark in this world so that they might be significant. Having their own little twist on things. Forget all that nonsense. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up. Stop sinning. Think about this stuff like the Word of God says. If you don't have knowledge of God, that is to your shame. You've got access to it. I have 70 Bibles in my office. I'll give you all of them if you need that many. 70 Bibles that I've purchased just to give away. That doesn't include the 40 plus Bibles that are mine, that I use all the time seemingly. You have unprecedented access to the knowledge of God through His Word. Get into it. Know it. Love it. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's difficult. Just like loving somebody is hard and difficult. Loving something is not Hollywood-esque, you know. No, it was just love at first sight, and it was just, we've never had any problems, right, Bets? She almost shook her head, yes, no-ish. I don't know, don't know what to... <laughs> we've had tons of problems, are you crazy? I'm a sinner, and so is she. What do you think you've got? And yet I've made covenant, so I'm going to love her. Even if it kills me. Yeah. And that is the way that we should think about it, folks. I'm serious. I am going to labor to love my wife, and I'm going to labor to love the church, and I am going to labor to know God and who He is, and praise Him for what He's given me. The, the call to wake up is because we are prone to falling asleep, we are prone to, to getting lazy or, or inoculated with this stuff. Wake up. Pay attention. Don't go on sinning. Careful who you're keeping company with. And careful what they're teaching. Is Jesus Christ crucified and nothing less? 
Is it teaching God's word as his special revelation as something that's important? Or, or are they presenting the gospel of them, saying that they are the ones and wisdom will die with them and you need to listen to me? Folks, you don't need to listen to me. There's plenty of other people out there that are going to tell you the truth. This just happens to be the place that it's happening and God has placed you today. And I pray that we together in Christ can labor as a congregation to be what God has called us. That we would wake from our stupor. Stop playing games because this is for real. And consider the things of Christ and the implications they have on our life. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Paul, the servant of Christ, who labored as he did as an example before us. And I pray that we would see that ex example and as we grow mature, repent of the sin that we have in our lives, that we'd be following that example in the word of truth. We would not get caught by all the distractions and all the things that potentially would draw us away. Bless us this morning and bless us this week. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this time in Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.